Good evening, fellow Toastmasters, and welcome guests. This event is now called to order. We need to let you know that by attending this online district speech contest, you agree to the privacy policy of Toastmasters International, as well as the unassociated remote hosting service. Some of your personal information, such as your name, image, and other shared messages may be shared with other meeting participants and will be recorded by Toastmasters International, who may use the recordings in the future as it sees fit. Your remote, your remote attendance hereby discharges Toastmasters International from all claims, demands, rights, promises, damages, and liabilities arising out of or in connection with the use or distribution of said video recordings, including, but not limited to, any claims for invasion of privacy, appropriation of likeness, or defamation. Thank you so much for your attention. Now, Please help me to give a warm, thunderous welcome to our contest master, Toastmaster Tara Cole. Thank you. Good evening, fellow Toastmasters and our most distinguished guest. Welcome to the International Speech Contest for District 47. I'm Tora Cole, and I am honored to serve as the contest master this evening. Serving with me as Zoom technical coordinators are distinguished Toastmaster Janine Kinsey, distinguished Toastmaster Dominic Kaloya, Toastmaster Kevin Sandoval. At this time, I would like to acknowledge all of the club members and officers of District 47 and Toastmasters International. Thank you for serving our members. I would also like to thank all of our guests for joining us this evening. Please use your Zoom reaction buttons at this time to show some love for all in attendance. Let's see those hearts and confettis popping in your screens. Let's see them, there they go. Thank you, everyone. Speech contests are a Toastmasters tradition. Each year, thousands of Toastmasters compete in the humorous, evaluation, table topics, and international speech contest. Competition begins with club contest, and winners continue to compete through the area, division, and district levels. Winners of the district level international speech contest proceed to the region quarterfinal. Following region quarterfinals, winners advance to the semifinals for a chance to take part in the World Championship of Public Speaking. Do we have a world champion with us today? We certainly hope so. The purposes of the International Speech Contest are to provide an opportunity to learn by observing the more proficient speakers who have benefited from their Toastmasters training and to recognize the best as an encouragement to all. The Zoom technical coordinators are instructed not to admit anyone into the contest room while the speakers are giving their presentations. In accordance with Toastmasters rules, you will be muted, your webcams and the chat will be turned off. At this time, Please help me give a warm welcome to our chief judge, distinguished Toastmaster Nardia Aldridge, to provide an overview of the rules of the International Speech Contest. Thank you, Contest Master. Good evening, dignitaries, distinguished Toastmasters, fellow Toastmasters, and most welcome guests. The International Contest follows all rules outlined in the general section of the current speech contest rulebook. The following additions and exceptions apply. It has been confirmed that all contestants are eligible. 
To be eligible, a contestant must A, be a Toastmaster in good standing of a club in good standing. B, have completed a minimum of six speeches from the competent communication manual or completed levels one and two from the same path in the Pathways program prior to this contest. C, not presently be an international district or area officer, nor have declared the intent to run for such offices. Contestants must create their own speeches and each must be substantially original. 25% or less of the speech may be devoted to quoting, paraphrasing, or referencing another person's content. Any quoted, paraphrased, or referenced content must be identified during the speech presentation. Contestants who have referenced another's contestant's speech will be disqualified. Speakers may stay in the room. Should they choose to leave the room, during the contest, they may return during the one minute of silence while the judges are marking their ballots. The time, sorry, I got muted. <laughs> the time of the speech is to be five to seven minutes. And a speaker speaking less than four minutes and 30 seconds or more than seven minutes and 30 seconds will be disqualified. The timing lights will be activated as follows. Timer, please activate the light as follows. Green light at five minutes. Yellow light at six minutes. And red light at seven minutes which will stay on until the speaker has finished speaking. No notice shall be given should the speaker go over time. Timing will start with the first word uttered or when the speaker uses any form of communication to the audience. There will be one minute of silence between speakers so the judges may complete their forms. All judges have been briefed and are confirmed, qualified and eligible to judge. There is a secret tiebreaker known only to me, the chief judge, whose ballot will only be utilized in the event of a tie. Judges have been instructed not to consider time in their ranking of the speakers. Protests are limited to eligibility and originality and can only be lodged by the voting judges and the contestants. Any protest should be lodged with the chief judge or contest chair prior to the announcement of the winner. All decisions of the voting judges are final. Contest master, that complete, completes the overview of the speech contest rules. Let the contest begin. Thank you, Chief Judge Distinguished Toastmaster, Nardia Aldridge. The contestants have drawn their speaking positions. The order is, Maritza Coscarelli, Godfrey McAllister, Patricia Rua, Terry Spencer, Anthony Serial, Nadia Vanderpool. The order again is Maritza Coscarelli, Godfrey McAllister, Patricia Rua, Terry Spencer, Anthony Sariel and Nadia Vanderpool. There will be one minute of silence between contestants while the judges mark their ballots. Are the timers ready? Are our timers ready? Yes, I am. Wonderful. Let's get started. Please put one minute of time on the clock as we prepare for our first contestant.
We will now begin the international speech contest. Welcome contestant number one, Maritza Coscarelli. Please provide a mic check. Mic check, test one, two, three, test. Thank you, we can hear you. Are you happy with your webcam framing? Yes, I am, thank you. Timer, please announce yourself. I'm the timer. Can you see the timer? Yes, I can. We recommend pinning the timer if you're comfortable doing so. I had the timer pinned. Now it's not an option for me. Technical coordinators, can we allow our contestant number one to pin the timer, please? Madam Contest Master, the timer is forcefully pinned for everyone, so they will be in the top right position no matter who you are. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Contestant number one, Maritza Coscarelli. Empowered. Empowered. Maritza Coscarelli. May I ask you a deeply personal question? I'll take that to mean yes. Have any of you, anyone, had a near-death experience? Then you know. Fellow Toastmasters, esteemed dignitaries and guests, if you have not, can you imagine yours? I don't have to. I remember it like it was yesterday. It had been a tough year, really. And I found myself curled up in a fetal position, immobilized by an excruciating migraine and nausea. My only company in the apartment, mm, the hum of my daughter's air conditioner in her New York City window, and the incessant clicking of her rabbit bean's tongue on its water bottle. I could barely breathe. I tried to calm myself with deep, slow inhales and exhales. And as I did, I noticed my thoughts. Oddly enough, in this debilitating moment, I was grateful. I was so grateful for this pillow and beds. I was so grateful for the movers who stayed behind in my vacated apartment when I just couldn't. I was grateful for the taxi driver, although I had to convince him I was not intoxicated or drugged, and he helped me with my things to the apartment door, unheard of. As I curled up and tried to rest, it dawned on me. I could be dying. You know, women suffer unique symptoms of a heart attack. This could be it for me. I tried to reach for my phone and you know, they're only ever an arm's length away, but I just couldn't muster up the strength. Instead, I communicated, albeit telepathically, with Bean the rabbit. Hey Bean, if I should die before I wake, make sure they know, my loved ones, that I died happy and grateful. Wow, I had come a long way. It wasn't always like that. How had I gone from a big haired toddler that just couldn't stop dancing to a professional ballerina in the lights of stages around the world to the darks of depression and back to the light. And then I remembered I now felt empowered. You see, it's the 1980s in the East Village, and I muster up the courage to go into a meditation center I've been eyeing for a while. I'm dressed in black, head to toe, boots and all. I walk in to a candlelit space, it smells like heaven on earth. To the right, a beautiful woman in a white shawl sits at a desk. To the left, the floor is strewn with sandals. I sign in where she indicates. 
and I struggle too loud and too hard to remove my boots. <sighs> I walk into the room in front of me and there they sit on genuinely filled pillows, evenly spaced, legs crossed, eyes shut. I shut mine tight and I open an eye now and then wondering, when are these people going to get started? Oh, this is it. I try again. And as the tension melts away, tears flood my face. I start to remember who I really am. You see, you get unplugged from your internal power source. I return to this place often, and this is the beginning, the beginning of a journey in raising my consciousness. You see, I'm here to share three keys of self-empowerment with you. The first, becoming self-aware, more aware of your surroundings and your impact on others. And then you begin in time to get clear. Yes, clarity, is the second key to your self-empowerment, creating clearer headspace, seeing the truth, listening intently, really paying attention. You see, your perspective dictates your attitude, and like it or not, your attitude dictates your behavior. I committed to non-negotiable high-performance habits. Yes, that is the third key. Commitment. I know, doesn't sound like freedom to you. But you see, discipline begets freedom. My very best season as a ballerina came when I committed non-negotiably to those habits, when I surrounded myself with people whose eyes lit up when I came into the room as mine did when I saw them not so different from the people you surround yourself with here. You see, we all have an opportunity to live empowered. We all can choose a path, a path of consciousness, clarity, and commitment. We can choose to create more joy, more freedom, more abundance, and if you think for one minute that this talk is about me or even about you, you're mistaken. This talk is about how we show up for ourselves and for one another when we feel empowered. You can choose to let yourself be happier. You can choose to live a life true to you and not the one others expect. You can choose believe it or not, to not work so much and so hard at everything. My fellow Toastmasters, you can choose to live like you're dying. Contest Master. May we have one minute of silence while the judges mark their ballots. Timer, please give me the red signal at one minute.
Welcome contestant number two, Godfrey McAllister. Please provide a mic check. One, two, three. Thank you, we can hear you. Are you happy with the webcam framing? Yes, I am, thank you. Timer, please announce yourself. And the timer. Can you see the timer? The timer is in the first box. I don't see the timer. Uh, yes, okay, fine, I see the timer now. <laughs> Great, thank you. Let's get started. Godfrey McAllister. That's life, and I love it. That's life, and I love it. Godfrey McAllister. Of all the things your mother taught you, what do you remember the most? This is what I remember. If you don't laugh at life, life will laugh at you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what my mama taught me. Nothing could prevent my mother from loving life and laughing. Did she sometimes face big problems and difficult situations? Of course, she did. She had me, an 11 pound bouncing baby boy. And that was just the beginning of her problems. But through it all, in good times and bad, she self-medicated with laughter and loved her life until she stopped living at the age of 105. Now that's life. And my mama loved it. Contest master, fellow Toastmasters, dignitaries and guests. Have you noticed that life is full of confusing opposites and contrasts? And yet they all complement each other in this intricate matrix called life. There would be no east without a west, no north without a south, no up without a down. It would be wrong to have a right without a left. And without the fear of public speaking, there would be no Toastmasters International. For that's life. And I love it. I thought about life as I sat securely strapped suspended in midair with my feet nervously dangling from the floorless cabin of Kraken, that monster roller coaster in Orlando, Florida at SeaWorld. I knew I was about to helplessly plunge 150 feet to what could be my certain death, were it not for the precautions put in place to protect me. I even secured my <laughs> denture with super poly grip just in case I began screaming like everybody else. Moments later, as I left the ride, mm -hmm, denture still in place, a strange sensation overcame me. I wanted to ride the roller coaster all over again. Wow. Life is like a roller coaster. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down but it is the ups that carry you down and the downs that carry you up. And neither one is more important than the other for they are equal partners in this wonderfully amazing complex roller coaster ride called life. But has life ever thrown you a curve ball? It might've been the death of a loved one, a financial transaction gone horribly wrong, or even betrayal by a trusted friend. Occasionally, whether at work, at home, at school, or at play, life will knock you down. But always remember, only you can keep you down. For life is always eager to help you get back up whenever you are ready. During my 70 years of life, I've experienced the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. I began my life insurance sales career at Life of Jamaica in October 1978. In my first three months, I broke all individual records. 
1980, I earned for myself the highest seat at the ultimately prestigious international million dollar round table. But then, at the height of my insurance sales career, a major betrayal by my employer completely demoralized me and paralyzed my will to sell insurance. From being the ultimate sales hero, my sales dropped to zero. And three months later, betrayed, broken, bankrupt, and useless to my employer, I was fired. Believe me, getting fired feels bad. But bad things could be the best things that ever happened to us when we learn to embrace disappointment and defeat as stepping stones for success. One month after I was fired, I was hired by American Life Insurance Sales Company. Once again, I shattered all insurance sales records. And for the next seven consecutive years, I was the number one agent in American Life Insurance Company's world of over 60 countries each year, breaking my own record. Now, that is my story. But far more importantly, what is your story? The details of our stories will differ, but I'm sure you will all agree that the roller coaster ride of life is filled with ups and downs, twists and turns, triumphs and tragedies. COVID, Delta, and Omicron came and brought with them disruption, destruction, and death. But they left us with life. Not to complain about life's constant conflicts and the cascading challenges, but to enjoy its roller coaster ride, to stop long enough to smell the flowers every day, to help someone along their way, and to give thanks to God each day for his generous gift of life. Like my mama did, learn to laugh at life's ups and downs. Enjoy the good times, endure the bad times. Love the life you live and live the life you love. Then one day we'll all be able to say, that's life and I love it. Contest Master. May we have one minute of silence while the judges mark their time, their balance. Timer, please show me the red signal and one minute. Welcome, contestant number three, Patricia Rua. Patricia Rua, please provide a mic check. Um, mic check, mic check. Thank you, we can hear you. Are you happy with your webcam framing? I will be in a second. So I'm just changing. Okay. Great timer. Please announce yourself. I am the timer. 
Can you see the timer? I see a background. There, okay, I see. Okay, got it, got it, got it, okay. So Perfect. Sorry. Thank you, let's get started. Contestant number three, Patricia Rua, my mini mentor. My mini mentor, Patricia Rua. I've never had a mentor per se. No one to guide me from point A to point Z in my career. But I have had many mentors, tiny but mighty beyond imagination. Little lamps to light the path when I crawled through the valleys of the shadow of death. Some time ago, I had an episode of depression so crippling that I had to move back to my mom's house. Depression is not a choice. Depression is more like an autoimmune disorder where your mind mistakenly attacks itself because it thinks it's a foreign body. The brain releases a ruthless army of fighter cells that distort your thinking and destroy your sense of self. They suck all hope from your soul and extinguish your light. When the battle is over, all that's left is intense, unspeakable despair. This particular depression was so deep, so dark, and so crushing that I felt like I was at the bottom of the sea in the Marianas Trench. It was as if cement had been injected into my limbs, leaving me paralyzed in my bed. I never felt so helpless in my life. And that's when I met my mini mentor. I heard a buzzing sound on the floor. It was an insect struggling on its back, trying to right itself. Even though I thought the poor guy was a goner, I flipped it over gently. Moments later, it started to crawl around and get its bearings. But then the unimaginable happened. The bug began to glow. It lit up like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. It was a firefly. It was a firefly. And then, I kid you not, it flew up to my bed. But even more amazing, it crawled onto my hand. The firefly seemed to be telegraphing a message. Instead of the dots and dashes of Morse code, it used long glows and short syncopating flashes. Now, I don't speak firefly, but apparently my heart does. And this is what it heard. <laughs> Patricia, por favor, listen to me. I risked my life and limbs to get here. I almost smacked myself into smithereens from banging against the walls, the windows, and the ceilings in this 5,000 square foot house. Caramba! What were the builders thinking? Patricia, I was kaput, but I came back to life because you turned me over. In the estate journey, you can't turn, flip yourself over. Pero, someone else can. Ah, that brave bug was urging me to launch an SOS flare and let someone know I needed help. But to be depressed is to shut down, isolate, and become mute. When your self-esteem is pulverized, there's no way you're going to brock us. Help! Help! I feel like roadkill! You're too ashamed to be seen in that condition. I preferred to rot in bed. But that firefly, that fearless firefly, she was a spark plug. She ignited my spirit, my courage. 
somehow, despite the torpor, I was able to call my best friend. Carolyn, it's Patty. I know, I know, I'm sorry I haven't called you back. Carolyn, I'm scared. I'm really scared. Carolyn, I don't know how much longer I can hold on. She booked me an emergency appointment to see a psychiatrist the next day. And I got the medical attention I needed. I'm not gonna lie, it took time to recover. But because I let my friend and my doctor turn me over, my light began to shine again. My inner firefly began to flicker and then to glow and finally to soar. And I was able to fly out of my mom's house and back to my own. Can you remember a time when life thrust you down into the bowels of hell? Well, I'm here to tell you that there are mentors down there, angels in disguise, angels in every size, from mini luminous fireflies to giant ones with dynamite. They will blast a tunnel out of Hades for you and bring you back up to the light of the world. Madam Contest Master. May we have one minute of silence while the judges mark their ballots. Timer, please show the red signal at one minute. Welcome contestant number four, Terry Spencer. Please provide a mic check. Mic check, mic check, mic check. Thank you, we can hear you. Are you happy with your webcam framing? I am. Great. Timer, please announce yourself. I am the timer. Can you see the timer? Timer. I can. Great, thank you. Let's get started. Contestant number four, Terry Spencer. I quit, and so should you. I quit, and so should you. Terry Spencer. Everyone lies to their kids, particularly when they're little. Now, most of the lies are harmless. If you're good, Santa Claus will bring you lots of toys at Christmas. You lose a tooth, a Fairy sneaks into your room at night and slides a dollar under your pillow. Mommy and Daddy need you to go with Grandma this afternoon because we desperately want to mop the kitchen floor. But Madam Contest Master, honored dignitaries, fellow Toastmasters, and most welcome guests, 
Not all of the lies are harmless. Some of them can be quite insidious, particularly if they're believed into adolescence and adulthood. They can cause academic failure, emotional turmoil, even financial ruin. And the lie that I believe is at the top of the pile is this. Winners never quit. Wrong, 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 wrong. Winners quit all the time. In fact, I think it is one of the things that separates the winners from everyone down to the losers. Winners know when to quit, they know where to quit, they know why to quit, and they know how to quit. They're not gonna throw good money after bad. They're not gonna throw good time after bad. And they are especially not going to throw good emotion after bad. Think about your own lives for a moment. We're all winners here, right? Of course we are. How many of you have ever quit a job or even a career because you knew that if you didn't, you would soon be looking for a really tall building off which to do a swan dive? How many of you have ever quit a relationship because you knew that if you didn't, you would soon be looking for a really tall building off which the other person to do a swan dive? See, wasn't it better to quit rather than wind up in a cemetery or prison? Now, I'm not suggesting you can quit under all times and under all circumstances. Sometimes, frankly, it's immoral to quit. For example, I don't think you can ever quit on your children, no matter how old they are, no matter how much they frustrate you, no matter how much they anger you, no matter how much they even hurt you, you have to stick with them. They're not the ones who decided to mop the kitchen floor some Saturday afternoon, beginning their arrival nine months later. No, that was on you. You created them. You have to stick with them until you are in your grave. I also don't think you can ever quit on a sick relative, particularly if you've made a promise. When my widowed father was diagnosed with lung cancer, we were told he had six months to live. So I moved back in with him to take care of him and to oversee his medical treatment. He wound up living 18 months. Now, I'm glad he did. He got an extra year of life we didn't think he was going to get. We got to know each other just a little bit better as adults. I got to pay back just a tiny fraction of everything that he had done for me in life. But did it hurt my career? Temporarily. Did it hurt some of my relationships? Temporarily. Did it leave me with some deep emotional scars over which I will never recover? Definitely. But what was I supposed to do? Dad, I don't know how to tell you this. And it's not you, and it's not even really the cancer. It's me. I need to get out there. I need to explore. Maybe we can get together for lunch sometime, OK? No. This is not breaking up with your high school sweetheart. This is life. Sometimes you have to stick things out. But under most other circumstances, it is perfectly okay to quit. Sometimes it's even the best choice. Let's say I decide that I wanna become a world-class sprinter like my idol, Usain Bolt. So I take a sabbatical from my job and I go into training because I'm going to make the 2024 USA Olympic team. Never mind the fact that I'm going to be 63 years old soon. Never mind the fact that I could still lose 30 pounds. Never mind the fact that I was slow when I was 15 and skinnier. No, I, I can do this. People are going to pay big money to watch me run and not to laugh, but because I am a champion. Now, I would hope that my friends would come to me and say, Terry, what are you doing? You're ruining your life. You're destroying your family. You need to quit. And I would hope I would have the sense enough to listen to them. History is replete with examples of ordinary people who've gone on to bigger and better things because they knew when to quit. The perfect example, Walt Disney. When Walt was a young man, he was a journalist. I'm a journalist. He got himself a job as a reporter at his hometown newspaper. But after a couple of years, his editors came to him and said, Walt, <laughs> your stories, they lack pizzazz. Your ideas, they lack creativity. So they fired him. 
Now, he probably could have gotten himself another job at another newspaper, had a 40-year career as a perfectly acceptable, mediocre reporter, but he said, you know what? Maybe this journalism thing isn't for me, but I do have an idea for a cartoon mouse. I think I'm gonna pursue that instead. Billions of fans later, hundreds of billions of dollars later, I think he made the right choice. You'll notice what I'm not saying. I'm not saying you can quit just when things are getting hard. No, in fact, that's when the winners double down. If they could see a path forward intellectually, emotionally, financially, they will do whatever it takes. They'll get a mentor, they'll hire a coach, they'll buy the equipment. They will get across that finish line. Isn't this what we want for our children? If we tell them that it is sometimes okay to pick up and move on, they will be willing to try the cornucopia of life. They'll try music and dance, science, languages, sports, math, because they will know that some decision they made when they're 15 or 17 years old isn't gonna stick with them for the rest of their lives. And if they do that, they will be willing to try different things until they find that one that gives them the emotional satisfaction, that satisfies them intellectually, that leads them to a career, maybe even finds them love. This is what we want for our children. But the only way they'll get there is if we tell them it's sometimes okay to quit. And that, my fellow Toastmasters, is no lie. Madam Contest Master. May we have one minute of silence while the judges mark their ballots. Timer, please show me the red signal at one minute. Welcome contestant number five, Anthony Serial. Please provide a mic check. This is me, can you hear me well? Thank you, we can hear you. Are you happy with your webcam framing? I think that I am, I'm good. Timer, please announce yourself. I am the timer. Can you see the timer? Timer, can yes. you show the green background? You can see the timer. Perfect, thank you. Let's get started. Contestant number five, Anthony Seriol. Ask twice, ask twice, Anthony Seriol. Contest master, dignitaries, fellow Toastmasters, I have something to admit to all of you. I hardly ever start a conversation with, how are you? I know it's seen as impolite or unconventional, but I've been conditioned to believe that no one really cares how I'm actually doing. The sales clerk, the deli counter clerk, the neighbor walking their dog, they all ask me, how are you? But none of them really genuinely care or even provide an opportunity for me to answer anything other than, that's fine. I don't know about you, but what would actually get me to answer is if they asked twice, which is my goal with all of you today. I'm asking you to do something you're already doing by using something you already have with people you already know, and hopefully some people you might not know. I just want you to ask 
twice. I know I'm already asking so much of you as it is. You've already done so much being here today. And you are giving me, someone you hardly know, your undivided attention in a very divided and distracting world. By the end of my speech, I hope to empower you with the desire to give the people you care about the same thing you are giving me right now. Time and attention. Ask them, how are you? Wait for them to give a quick answer. They're going to probably respond by asking how you're doing, but here's where you mix it up. You ask again, no, really, how are you? You don't have an incredible answer to how you can find more joy, success, or love in your life, but I do believe that sometimes the right question is more effective than any answer. I don't know about you, but I go days without my phone ringing, weeks without a knock at my door, and don't even ask me the last time I received a handwritten letter. I would settle for a, a thoughtful email at this point. I honestly don't know what troubled me more throughout the quarantine, how often telemarketers called me, or how seldom my friends and family did. Regardless of the temperature outside, the world seems to have become quite cold and closed. Social distancing has expanded much further than six feet, and it's hard to even engage in conversation these days because everyone seems to focus far too much on our differences, how people vote, whether or not they get vaccinated, their religious belief, the news they believe, the channels they watch. So many of us have lost our faith in politicians, in scientists, in God, but we can't afford to lose our faith in each other and in ourselves. We need to focus on the many things we all universally have in common. We all need food, water, shelter, sleep. We get sad, we get lonely, we wanna be loved. We wanna feel like we matter. We seek to create memories and share those memories with others because no one wants to be the one in every single photo. And yet, despite knowing we have all of this in common, there are people starving with a fridge full of food because they hunger for purpose. They thirst for conversation. There are people who live in abundance, their homes are filled, but they feel empty. There are people who feel completely alone in crowded rooms because they just want someone to look away from their cell phone into their eyes to acknowledge they exist. There are people in warm, cozy homes that are frozen in fear by their anxieties. There are people with beautiful voices who suffer in silence. I believe that so many of us want nothing more than for someone to genuinely ask us, how are you? And then give us the time, the space, and the patience it takes for us to come up with a seemingly simple answer to a question we've been conditioned our whole lives to either not answer or just say whatever we think the person wants to hear. I think, I feel, I believe that it is a matter of life and death. I know that three words can change someone's life, whether it's the person saying it or the person hearing it. I know it takes only a few minutes to save someone's life. Because I know indisputably that it takes only a few minutes for someone who feels afraid, alone, and abandoned 
to take their own life. I learned this lesson the worst way it could be taught when I lost my 26 year old niece to suicide. Everyone looked at her social media and assumed she was perfectly fine and happy, but no one knocked on her door. No one called. No one took the time to ask her, how are you? And now no one can. I beg all of you, please put your differences aside. Stop this ceaseless arguing with the people you care for. There's no point in being right if no one you love is left. Anything that stands between you and the people you love, the people who love you, isn't worth having in the way. You have an amazing tool at your disposal right now. Ask, how are you? Ask twice. Thank you. May we have one minute of silence while the judges mark their ballots. Timer, please show the red signal at one minute. Welcome contestant number six, Nadia Vanderpool. Please provide a mic check. Mic check. Mic check. A little louder. Mic check. Mic check. Are you happy with your webcam framing? I am. All right. Your voice is coming in a little on the soft side. At a hundred percent, I will just speak louder. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay. You're happy with your webcam framing? I am. Can you see the timer? Timer, please announce yourself. I am the timer. Can you see the timer? The volume is still on the little lower side, so I would suggest you speak a little louder. All right, let's get started. Contestant number six, N Nadia Vanderpool. Why settle? Why settle? Nadia Vanderpool. It's puzzling to me that man can invent a computer chip that mimics the human brain. Then again, Considering the level of some people's IQ, this could be somewhat simple. But when I think about other inventions like the highly advanced cell phones that can tap into your location and track you down like an investigator on Peters, or even those new Tesla vehicles that can detect its own system malfunction and proactively order replacement parts, I'm curious to know, how is it that no one has invented a system that can create the perfect mate who meets all of the requirements of the one in search of love? Considering the track record 
This should be a no-brainer. But I guess finding true love is just not this simple. Contact share, fellow Toastmasters and guests. Sometimes I wonder, does the perfect guy even exist? Honestly, I have no idea. But I can tell you this, through dating, you are able to bet a number of options simultaneously. And this will save you a lot of time and heartache. Believe it or not, this hasn't always been my perspective on how I would find the man of my dreams. But after my last relationship, I now understand why Maureen Dodd said, when you settle for less than you deserve, you get even less than you've settled for. So my question to you is, why settle? I believe that many of you are settling in your lives and maybe you don't even realize that you are. How many of you have been trying for a very long time to improve your public speaking skills? Are you still allowing fear to prevent you from progressing? Or what about those of you who have been making New Year's resolutions for the past five years to lose 15 pounds? Are you still struggling because your autopilot is set to fast food restaurants or any place other than the gym? And what about those dead end relationships that you refuse to let go of because you feel a sense of obligation? Can any of you relate? That relationship I spoke about earlier, I will share how that experience has taught me why it's never acceptable to settle for less than you want in life. I had been dating this guy for a little over one year. To my knowledge, everything was fine until I noticed a change in his behavior. Apparently, he realized that we were not alive and he abruptly ended our courtship. Well, this experience, though heartbreaking, was revolutionary. It made me ask myself, why settle? I decided to step outside of my comfort zone and do something that is untraditional for women. I began serial dating. And boy, can I tell you, this unconventional style of dating has transformed me. I was in search of love, but what I found is something more valuable than anything I could have asked for. I found me. And I am here to tell you that you too can have this very same self-discovery if you just believe in yourself. So maybe you need advancement in your professional careers. Or maybe you've been planning to further your education. Or what about your partnership that is just not offering the love, support, or the attention you desire? Whatever dream, whatever goal, whatever area in your life you're trying to improve, I challenge you right now to make the decision to stop settling. Stop making excuses, stop putting off the day for tomorrow, stop being controlled by the labels of society, and most importantly, stop settling for less than you deserve. Like me, step outside of your comfort zone. Embrace the uncertainty. Take a risk 
and go after your dreams. Challenge yourselves. I promise you, what you will find is a world that needs you, that needs your gifts, that needs your talents, that needs you to be the best version of you. So free yourselves and go beyond the limits and you will begin to live your best life. And since we have only one life to live, I ask you the question, why settle? Content master. May we now have silence while the judges complete their ballots. Judges at this time, please complete your ranking of the contestants. As a reminder, please print and sign your name at the bottom of your ballot. Make sure you have one name for first, second, and third place, and send a copy of your ballot to the ballot counters as instructed to do so during the brief judge's briefing. Ballot counters, please remain in this room until you have received all of the ballots assigned to you, and then exit to the chief judge's room. Timers, please take a picture of your timing sheets and send them on to the chief judge. Zoom technical coordinators, please let me know when the chief judge and ballots counters have left the room.
Contest master, the chief judge and the ballot counters have left the room. Thank you. Let's give our contestants a big round of applause using those reaction buttons at the bottom of your screen. Show them some love, show them the hearts, thumbs up, any type of emoji button you want, go ahead and show them the love. And while we are waiting for the votes to be counted, let's get to know our contestants. Technical coordinators, please allow the contestants to unmute themselves and turn on their cameras. Let's see those faces. Phew! We can all now breathe a big sigh of relief. It's over, you're done. Congratulations and well done, everyone. There is no stress here. We're just gonna get to know you a little bit. These are questions that are gonna be easy. They're all about you. And let's get started with contestant number one. Maritza Coscarelli. First of all, congratulations on winning the Table Topics Contest on Thursday evening. No small feat. And here you are again. Tell us, what drives you to compete? And why should other Toastmasters compete in Toastmasters speech competitions? Wow. Well, thank you, Tora, for the congratulations and for doing an amazing job tonight. And for that question that really has me thinking, that's thought provoking. What drives me to compete? You know what's funny? I don't feel driven to compete. I feel driven to improve, to learn, and to serve. That's what drives me, improving, learning, and serving. And when you compete, I think that you raise your own standard, your own best version of yourself, and therefore you're required to get even better and even better. And I feel so supported by mentors, coaches, friends, and fellow Toastmasters. So it's difficult to say no, but I really love the learning, improving, and serving part of competition. Thank you. And certainly that's what Toastmasters is all about, about learning, serving, and definitely improving. That's why we're here. So fellow Toastmasters out there that are watching, please, next contest season, step up and compete. Absolutely. Our contestant number two, Godfrey McAllister. You coined your favorite quote as, the only thing over which you have complete control is your perspective. Share with us exactly what you mean by this. We as human beings, we like to believe that we are in control. Mm -hmm. The time that we are born, the baby is born with a controlled DNA. Mm -hmm. The baby controls the mother. The baby knows what songs to make, to evoke what kind of responses it wants from the mother. As we grow older, 
we like to control. We, the grasp becomes very strong. This is mine. I want to control mine. And it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. And some people will argue that it goes all the way into marriage, where sometimes there's a conflict for control. But the bottom line is that we are never fully in control of anything. We might think we are, but we are too small to be, in fully, to be fully in control of anything except one thing. And that's our perspective. So whereas we may not be able to change the facts of life, we may not be able to change the fortunes and the circumstances that we encounter, but we can certainly change our reaction to them. We can certainly change how we view them. We can change our perspective on anything because the only thing over which we have complete control is our perspective. Thank you, you're absolutely correct. And I saw that firsthand during the WhatsApp chat between Anthony and yourself, two different perspectives. So thank you again for sharing that. Contestant number three, Patricia Rua. I have to say congratulations to you also on winning the humorous speech contest. Congratulations. Thank you. I also read that you're a student. So what are you currently studying and what do you hope to do at the completion of your studies? I am studying writing. That's what I'm studying. But not because I, I have no I have no agenda on what I want to do after I'm finished. Yeah. And so whoops. Anyway, so no, so that's it. I'm I'm just studying writing. And the second question, what, what do I plan to do? I don't know. <laughs> that's it. Well, we know you can certainly write speeches, correct? <laughs> that will be, you, yeah. you'll, you'll be able to, to improve on your speech writing. Yes, Thank I'm you. really good. Thank you so much. Contestant number four, Terry Spencer, you mentioned that you are a journalist. And I read somewhere, doing a little bit of homework, that as a journalist, you covered the Dahlia DiPolito case and were interviewed by ABC's 2020 show. How did Table Topics help you prepare for that? Well, thank you, uh, Madam Contest Master. Yes, that was two hours, basically, of Table Topics. That happened on the last day before we went into quarantine for COVID. I went to a house in Dania Beach that they had rented this ABC crew and I sat in there on the other side, because I'm usually the one asking the questions. This time I was the one answering the questions. And it went on for two long hours. And I wound up being in the 2020 for maybe five to seven minutes, probably at the end. But it was great because there were no ahs and ums. There was no hesitation. I got my points across concisely and I can, credit all that to Toastmasters and Table Topics, because isn't that what Table Topics is, is just answering off the top of your head and trying to do the best you can. And then driving home it was just weird because it was <laughs> everybody was sort of on the street going, is this the last time we're going to be outside for a while? Wow, thank you for that. And certainly Table Topics is one of perhaps the most feared as well as the most loved parts of the, of the <laughs> Toastmasters meeting. Thank you for sharing that. Anthony, in the contestants WhatsApp chat, there were a few <laughs> messages that came to Atlas and Addis, and you wrote, I am Anthony, friends called me Atlas. Tell us how and why you got this nickname. Um, thanks. Thanks for acknowledging that there's a possibility other people gave it to me instead of it being like, because I'm so buff. My friend started calling me Atlas. Um, it actually happened from two different people for two different reasons in the same week. The first is because I'm extremely empathetic. So people say that all the time. I, I really am. I was having lunch with a friend at Panera Bread and I lost my appetite and I couldn't figure out why because I should have been really hungry. It was a long day. 
and but I could feel like somebody was suffering. So I look around and there's this little boy, maybe eight, nine years old, playing his DS and his dad is on one business call after another, ignoring him. And the kid was just so disheartened. Later on, uh, I was talking to my friend Christy and I was giving her some advice, some just general guidance, not necessarily telling her like where to go, but just sort of helping her understand like what either of those options would look like. So she said, you know, I like the way that you talk to me. You don't tell me what to do or where to go. You just show me what's possible, like a map, like an atlas. The lunch date, the guy um, I was hanging out with my friend, we were close friends for a while and he had seen that happen to me a lot of times, sort of taking in something nearby emotionally or mentally. And he said, you know, I see you go through this so often, you know, you can't continue taking the weight of the world. You're like Atlas, you know, bearing all the world's burden on you. Um, they were of event planners, they were promoters. And I started speaking uh, throughout Miami and South Florida. Um, and I had art gallery showings and speaking events. And they actually didn't put me up by my name. They put Atlas and some of them did it intentionally because they had to do the artists in alphabetical order and having a name that started with A with no last name meant that I would be the first name that most of the attendees would see. So it's been that way for well over 10 years now. My friends, my family, uh, they all call me Atlas. Wonderful, thank you. And we could certainly feel your empathy come through during your speech. Thank you for sharing that Atlas. We consider you a friend. And contestant number six, Nadia Vanderpool. I read that one of your hobbies is fitness and bodybuilding. Of course, I was a little curious and I looked up and you were the 2020 Bahamas Bikini Wellness Champion. That's a lot of training of the gluteus maximus and the legs. How did you manage to train with Jim's clothes for more than a year and a half in Nassau? The competition that I, where I would have won the title, the 2020 Wellness Bikini Champion, that was just before the onset of the pandemic. But um, once the pandemic would have kicked in, all of the gyms closed down here in the Bahamas or in Nassau. And I have a group of workout buddies. We support each other. We are more of brothers and sisters, we call ourselves. So we all gathered up all of the weights we had. Some of us had five pounds, some had 10 pounds, some had 20 pounds. So whatever weights or equipment we could come up with, we pulled them together and then we trained on the outside. So we would meet at the park or at the 66 Steps, which is a um, tourist destination here in the Palmas. Um, so we would meet either at the steps, at the park, on the beaches, every morning still at 5 a.m. and we would train together with whatever equipment we had. So we still managed to get some training in even though it wasn't the intense training as if we would have had at the gym, but we were able to get something in. Wow. I was actually locked down in Nassau during that time. I had just flown back home to Florida and came back Actually, I was there for a day or two and I got text messages saying Nassau was getting ready to shut down, get back. <laughs> and so I saw lots of people at the park exercising. So well done, keeping yourself in shape. Contestants, thank you all again. The judges have finished making all of counting all of the ballots. And at this time, I would like to say congratulations to all of the contestants. And this is now the moment that we've all been waiting for. The announcement of our winners. And we see the drum roll there. There are no disqualifications. The third place winner of the District 47 International Speech Contest is Patricia Rua, congratulations. Yes. <laughs> congratulations. The second place winner of District 47 International Speech Contest is Anthony Sariol. Congratulations, Anthony. And the first place winner of District 47 
international speech contest is Godfrey McAllister. Congratulations to all of our winners. This international speech contest is adjourned. Winners, please stand by so we can get a screenshot of you all. The winner of today's contest will go on to represent District 47 at the next level of contest, which is the region quarterfinals. Putting together a contest is no easy feat. Putting together four contests is almost unimaginable. There are so many moving parts and details to button down, even at the last minute. And I can tell you, even at the last minute before this contest. Please help me show some love and appreciation with your emoji buttons for District 47 contest co-chairs Distinguished Toastmaster Patricia Stevenson and Distinguished Toastmaster LaPedra Damianis. Thank you. It has been my pleasure to serve as the contest master this evening. On behalf of the contest, entire contest team and all of our contestants, thank you for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed the contest. To officially close out this district event, please help me welcome District 47, Contest Co-Chair, Distinguished Toastmaster, Patricia Stevenson. There we go. <laughs> it's usually me not able to speak because I've not unmuted myself. Thank you everyone and congratulations to all of our winners. Godfrey, it's up to you to take us all the way. We're wishing you all the luck in the world, which we know you don't need because you'll do a great job in representing our district. I'd also like to welcome my co-chair, LaPedra, to say a few words at this time. Come on down, LaPedra. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Patty. Yes, so congratulations to you all again this evening. You have done a superb job. Of course, we didn't expect anything less, but thank you all for your participation this evening once again. And to our attendees, we know that you enjoyed your time here. I'd just like to say one thing, three words. Clap, clap, yay! <laughs> Thank you all. Stay on for the festivities. We would like to take a picture. I think we have all of our speakers spot our winners spotlighted. If my contest team can confirm that, we will take their picture. I'm going to remove. I'm assuming somebody's helping me here. <laughs> there we go. Somebody have the picture? We got it, Janine. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Congratulations.